Today we're going over Micron, which has been a darling of the value investing community, both the YouTube community and in general like super investors. If you look at the 13Fs of people like Lee Lu, Monish Pabrai, Guy Spear, they all own Micron. And it's kind of interesting because usually, and I'll pull up their financials right now uh, just briefly, usually whenever uh, you're looking at a value investment, what happens is that it's usually a company that has, you know, is selling for a low PE and then what people's thesis is, is that the earnings are going to continue to grow or that the low PE is just not justified. But Micron really didn't do that. It's uh, it's actually had shrinking income. I mean, if I, if I show you this is their most recent quarter, the one ended June 2023, I mean, their operating income is minus 1600 you know and it's negative for march as well i mean it's it's really interesting so what i want to do is go through my story on micron i had a position i don't have one anymore then go through the general investment thesis and then go back and look at the financials and kind of show you the different valuations that i think could be justified let's say first though i want to talk about seeking alpha so i've been super picky with sponsors on this channel and seeking alpha is really neat because I was using a different service and paying about double what Seeking Alpha is worth. So I was paying close to $40 a month for basically news and historical financial data. That's all available on Seeking Alpha. I mean, look at this. You can even trend them like I do. Now, I recommend if you're going to trend, you make sure that you have latest on the right and then, you know, now, now you have a graph that follows left to right, you know. But anyway, uh, they also have a lot of news articles, and one of my favorite things that I've realized is that it's not just all like plain articles and news that just mentions your stock name. It's also like real analyst reports. I mean, I can show you a few um, here. I mean, they they have. I mean, it's a lot for every stock I own. I learned a lot just from just from reading these. So if you want to get a free trial that's not offered uh, through the normal website, then you can click the link below. And I really do recommend the software. I think it's really helpful and cheaper than most everything else out there. So with that out the way, let's talk about my story with Micron, okay? I sold my Micron, or how should I say this? I did not sell it. It was a sign because what happened was... I played with fire a little bit too much by selling short-term covered calls with Micron. Uh, I've been doing that for a while. Usually I'm not an options person at all because I'm dealing with smaller market cap stocks and the bid-ask spread on options is humongous. And then the time to expire is usually like months down the road. And what I was a fan of is the short-term options because I've said this before, but I really do think that the worst thing you can do with your money, if you wanted to lose it as fast as possible, would be to buy short-term out-of-the-money calls, okay? You know, like predict that a stock's gonna go up in the short term. So naturally, in my infinite wisdom, I said, well, I'm just gonna sell those sorts of things, right? So uh, I was getting, you know, I thought, you know, 1% a week or something, I would every once, not every week, that would be crazy returns. But like, if I saw an opportunity with somebody like Micron to get like a a 1% return for a week where I could sell an out of the money call, I would, I would usually do that. And it worked a few times, but then eventually they got assigned somewhere. It was, it was this year. It was one of these, one of these run ups. I forget which one, but I know that I missed out on it going all the way to 70 plus, so that was kind of disheartening. And that's, in general, the the downside of the covered calls. That's why I usually stay away from it. I'll just show you this quick graph real quick. Uh, let's see. Okay, yeah, covered call. In a normal, you know, buy and hold type position in a stock, your, your profit here on the y-axis is just related to whatever the stock price is, okay? If the stock price goes up, your profit goes up. What you do whenever you sell a covered call is that you pretty much lift that line up, okay? So now for the stock price staying the same, you get you actually do get some money, um, but the price you pay is that you pretty much cap your potential uh, gains, and that's, that's what happened to me, okay? So anyway, that's my story with Micron. Let me talk about like the general investment thesis because I think it's really interesting. So I think there's really two pieces with the investment thesis here. So Micron deals in memory, right? And so... That industry, and this is, you know, if you listen to Mona, she'll say the same thing. It's historically been boom or bust. Because of Moore's Law, new innovations in the industry has just completely wiped out uh, previous products, right? So, you know, you could be doing great selling your, your, your memory device, but then 
your competitor or yourself invents something else that's you know half the cost and does more than what your current device does. So basically it makes your existing portfolio of products just obsolete. So that dance had been going on for a long time between the memory people. But Moore's Law is really starting to get to the point where it's not going to continue at the rate that it's been, right? So Moore's Law is the idea that the amount of transistors they can fit on a fixed piece of, you know, area is doubling, you know, every two years. It's a little bit more than that now, but we're getting so small that it's not economical because you're having to, you know, remove so much heat because the atoms are so close together. You're having to factor in like things like quantum mechanics. So it's just, it's not sustainable, right? So from a memory side, we're getting to kind of a fixed product. I mean, there's still going to be some innovation, but it's not going to be this type of innovation that makes your previous products obsolete, right? So that's that's the one hand is that the supply is kind of running into this this asymptote or this wall, right, where you're going to have a fixed supply, you know, or at least not have great innovations, you know. And then the other side of the investment thesis is that the data that needs to be stored is increasing exponentially and I mean that that's this graph this is you know worldwide data created captured copied from 2010 so it goes to 2020 then they forecast 2021 to 2025 I, I look actually looked for actuals that I could not find it but you know this is really interesting and I and I don't like this format so I'll put it on Excel I'll show you so I just copied that put it on Excel and um, I mean you can see even if you had a linear growth in data, which I don't think it's going to be linear with all the advancements in AI and the metaverse, that sort of thing, you're going to have much higher growth in, uh, in, in data generation and the need for data storage. I mean, but look, even if it was linear, so let me draw just like a straight line. So even if it was linear between these last two points, you're talking that, you know, by 2028, you're almost 300 zettabytes of data and that's you know more than 50 percent growth so that's kind of the general thesis is that your supply side is running into a wall and your demand is growing exponentially so another way i like to think about it is that memory is like parking spaces for cars and that you know there's no more innovation as far as like the parking lots go but the amount of cars that need to park there is growing exponentially. So, you know, they're going to get to charge more for their product. Like I said, that's the basic thesis if you believe in the bull case. I would say the counter argument to that would be that there could be huge innovation on the data, like the software side of data innovation. Where if you can compress data, now you might have innovation on that side where even though you're, you're generating a lot of data, you're finding more efficient ways to store it. So it might not be as in high demand as we think. The other thing is that you could could still have innovation on the on the supply side people have been saying Moore's law is dying for probably 50 60 years and so I'm a little worried to to believe that as well but that's the counter arguments I lean more towards the bull case but at the same time I would also like to buy this stock at a reasonable price okay so that's gonna be what we do next let's look at the financials this is what i mean by boom and bust right this is every quarterly report from 2012 on and i mean you have spikes and then drops and the spike and drop spike drops so what comes next right i think you know a five-year-old could figure this out you know you're going to go up right and that's also i would say what's starting to be a little bit factored in into the stock price because even though revenue d drop like this and even earnings dropped if I, where's net income? I mean, net income went negative. You actually didn't see as terrible a drop in the stock price as you did for somebody like Intel, you know? And I think the distinction there is the memory versus processor, right? Because I think there's a lot of intricacies with the processor that's not as present in the memory devices. But that's the income statement. One thing I really like about Micron is that they have such a strong balance sheet. So like, even though they've had a down quarter, you really don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about them going under. I mean, look look at their total equity, $45 billion, and then debt is, let's see, debt's 14. So if you did a debt to equity ratio, and you know, technically if you do debt to equity, you're supposed to use total liabilities. I mean, everybody does it differently. So you do total liabilities, 20 divided by 45, 
you're going to have a debt to equity ratio less than one, which is really good, right? Your debt to equity is going to be 0.44. So anyway, balance sheet's good. One thing I always like to check on though is the cash flow statement. I think the cash flow statement is like super important to just for, for every company, but especially if you already know a company well, this is really all you have to follow because the cash flow statement can tell you the story about everything, right? Um, so I start like with operating cash flow. This is not ideal, right? But it is cyclical. And so you would think that it would come back from this, right? But I will say I would not have predicted this a year ago. And I don't think I did. Uh, if you watch my old videos of Micron, I, I really did think that this revolution I talked about between AI and metaverse was going to cause it to not be as boom and bust anymore. I think a lot of people felt that way. And so I was wrong for sure here. But what's interesting, like I said before, is that the stock price didn't really care about this. It's pretty interesting. Um, investing cash flow. This is really neat. So this is also classic behavior of a boom and bust company. So earnings go down, investing cash flow, and specifically capital expenditures. If I pull that up, so let's see, CapEx. If I pull CapEx up, I mean, look, they're really cutting back. So CapEx is negative because that's cash that's leaving the business, right? And this is where you can really put some numbers to the thesis that I mentioned before, okay? Because if you don't think you're going to have big innovations that make product lines obsolete that require huge CapEx to build whole new systems to make these new and improved chips, that, that sort of thing, you know, then CapEx is going to probably continue to be low. So let's just take this hypothetical low capex of like 1.5 billion a quarter remember these are quarterly values and then operating cash flow that returns to you know these peaks of you know four four billion per quarter and i would say if you believe in that imbalance supply and demand imbalance moving forward that it'd probably be higher operating cash flow right so but let's just say four okay so four billion operating cash flow minus 1.5 a quarter in capex you're looking at uh, what is that two and a half billion per quarter multiply that by four yeah so so ten billion dollars and that's the free cash flow number right because it's operating cash flow minus capex so if you're making ten billion dollars per year and it's a yearly number because I multiplied by four but anyway if you're consistently making ten billion dollars a year or even making ten billion dollars a year and growing I mean your stock price is definitely worth uh, or market cap's definitely worth, I would say, 80 to 100 billion minimum, right? So, you know, that brings your target price, let's just say, a hundred billion dollar market cap. So, a hundred billion dollar market cap translates to what stock price? I'll divide by the current market cap and then multiply by the current share price. I mean, that would be a stock price of about $90. So, if you believe that thesis, you we are sitting at about close to two thirds that so there is some margin of safety but i'm still waiting okay like i said i got my shares assigned i'm really hard-headed about i really don't want to pay more for a stock than i sold it for because of some you know shenanigans with the covered calls but maybe that's me being mistaken that but that's just how i look at it right i really do think that there's a lot of potential here i think the memory side much different than the other side of the chips you know where intel and nvidia and amd play in i think that's a completely different animal and you need to be much more knowledgeable of the industry to to handle that um and there's just crazier valuations on that side right if you look at amd and nvidia and stuff but anyway that's all i got i hope you enjoyed the video remember seeking alpha link below would really help the channel Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.